Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Elaine Jacquet. I'm the ICE country representative for South Africa and chairman of the ICSA division. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for uh, joining us this afternoon. Uh, we have a very interesting uh, discussion this afternoon and a very, very special guest. Um, we're very proud to host this online event, uh, trying to raise awareness about climate change and the important role that engineers have in the journey towards uh, reducing carbon emissions and zero carbon. Uh, as a background to the webinar, we actually, in the invitation, sent out uh, a request that you view our ICE president's uh, video, Shaping Zero, which was presented by the ICE president, Rachel Skinner, as part of her presidential address last year in November. Um, the uh, very important and exciting part is that we have Rachel Skinner with us this afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Rachel. And uh, thank you very much for making time to, to join us today. Uh, Rachel is the 156th president of the Institution of Civil Engineers and is the executive director of transport at WSP. Uh, she's a patron of Women in Transport, which is a not-for-profit organization and uh, is one of the founding board members since 2005. Uh, she is a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, a chartered engineer and a chartered transport planner. Uh, Rachel chairs the carbon stream for the infrastructure client group uh, and was recently invited to join the ex uh, external expert panel established to support the UK uh, Department of Transport's acceleration unit that is focused on a faster, better and greener recovery beyond COVID-19. Uh, she has also served two years as an infrastructure commissioner for Scotland from late 2018. Um, but more than that, she is very passionate about climate change and what engineers can do to mitigate this. Um, we also have on the panel this afternoon, uh, Friedrich Slubert, who is the chair of the SICE Transportation Division, uh, who's going to be able to give us a bit of a, a South African perspective on carbon, uh, carbon zero. Uh, and uh, he'll be available for the uh, Q&A session a little later on. Um, Friedrich is a professional engineer with 40 years of experience in the fields of transportation, water services, planning and the development of large infrastructure projects. He understands how to convert what to do to how to do. Uh, he's obtained his BNG Civil and BNG Honours Civil degrees from University of Pretoria. Uh, he commenced his engineering career with the former TPA Roads Department in 1981. In 1990, he joined Ullman Vitas and Prince Consulting Engineers, which is now Mariswick Consulting, where he became a director in 1997. In 2013, he retired from UWP and in May 2015 established Siendum Academy. I hope I've said that correctly. Um, with Dr. Johan Bosman, who retired in 2020. And he is currently the chairperson of this IC transportation division. Um, the webinar today is going to start off with just a, a brief, uh, short uh, video clip, uh, which was the trailer to Rachel Skinner's um, presidential address in November, uh, just to set the scene a little bit, and then we'll ask Rachel to give us a bit of an introduction on how we uh, proceed with um, our approach to carbon zero and how it's gone since November. Um, so let's uh, see if I can get top technology working and uh, go from go for the trailer of the video. Uh, let's see if this is going to uh, perform. Imagine a world where we work together towards net zero carbon, where we pull together not just around the ICE flag, but with others like us. When, when you know that something is doing you harm, then it, there is no excuse for not doing something. Making something your priority is what makes the difference. Imagine if we actually pooled our knowledge and expertise in order to make real, rapid progress. The Institution of Civil Engineers are people who could be right at the heartbeat of the whole thing. 
we understand the danger that we're in at the moment on this planet. Engineers understand ecology. Science does really matter. We are the world's inventors, innovators and practical problem solvers. So civil engineering is at the heart of everything we're doing. We have to reinvent ourselves. Uh, this is our ocean basin. I think as engineers we need to start thinking outside the box. We are at the forefront of research. But everyone working on these projects wants them to be the greenest. We are starting to pay more attention to it. Today, the engineering profession is waking up to its responsibility. That was a, a very brief snippet, and it was an excellent introduction to your video, Rachel. Um, thank you very much for putting that together. I think it is a very, very important part of our awareness of what carbon emissions are about. Uh, so over to you and um, tell us a little bit about how you, what your experience has been in the progress towards uh, carbon zero uh, so far as president of ICE. Sure. Um, thank you, Alan. Gosh, it's been a while since I've seen that, that trailer. It's funny to see it again now, actually. <laughs> but there we go. Um, no, fantastic, though. Thank you very much for the invitation to join in with this discussion today. Um, actually, I really do look forward, before I start talking, I really do look forward to hearing lots and lots of questions from, from those of you listening when we get on to the, the Q&A piece a bit later on. So by way of very, very quick introduction, um, my theme as ICE president for this year, as you've just seen, is called Shaping Zero. And it is all about, as Elaine has just outlined, the, the, the crucial importance of focusing on climate change to achieve net zero carbon for the world. But more, more specifically, the role that we as infrastructure professionals now, and of course, infrastructure professionals of the future, need to play all over the world if we are going to get to that net zero position because it is no exaggeration to say that this is the key to our long run future on this planet, which I presume is something we'd all be happy to sign up to as a, as a sort of an end goal that we all have in common and that we can, we can all agree is obviously reasonably important. Um, so in my view, it is just time, frankly, that everybody working in the infrastructure space, whether they are civil engineers, whether they are people supporting the engineering community, whether they're in the wider infrastructure space, it's time that everybody starts to really understand the links between climate change and what we all do in terms of creating infrastructure systems and between what we all do and those carbon emissions, between what we do and the potential to achieve net zero carbon. And of course, also between what we do and our ability to defend ourselves against the worst effects of climate change, which are already out there in many forms across the world um, until the point that we can get to a net zero balance and start to restore uh, a, a better global balance in terms of the way the world around us works and our impact on it. So it, it strikes me in, in terms of many of you listening to this session today, that climate action, all these different things that we can do all across the world to help towards that goal of net zero carbon, and in specific terms, the, the role of infrastructure in achieving those outcomes is absolutely going to be a key driver, a key pivot point for change. And it's not going to be something that's just there for the rest of my career, but also probably for the whole of your careers as well as, as they play out um, across, across the world, whether that's in South Africa, whether that's elsewhere, it doesn't matter. This is going to be something that affects everybody everywhere. So I hope that lots of you have already had a chance to watch the, the full Shaping Zero film. What you saw there was just a just a taster or a teaser, <laughs> but there's, there's a 25 minute film for those who haven't um, seen it. Um, it is terrifying actually to me to realise that time has flown and essentially I'm now halfway through my year as, as ICU president, pretty much exactly uh, six months in now. So I guess what I wanted to talk to you about today is first of all I just wanted to set the scene a little bit more in terms of the piece where we all come in and be very, very clear about where we can really hope to have impact. But then I want to talk about how we turn all this talk, events like this one, you know, wherever they might be in the world, whether they're online or in person, hopefully if, if COVID ever allows that sort of thing again, how, how can we turn all this talk into real action? So how can we all work together as infrastructure and built environment experts across the world to slow down and ideally halt climate change. 
And I recognize there is a real challenge there because there are so many different start points. There are so many different contexts. There are so many different competing interests, whether it's political or economic or environmental or social or other dimensions. It is not a one size fits all solution. There is no magic answer that we can get to, but we have to turn this talk, this understanding around the need for climate action into actual action. Otherwise, all we're doing essentially is wasting time. So this point around speed really does matter. Um, and what, what I guess I want to come on to towards the end of, of my talk today is, is to give you a quick update in terms of some of the specific things that are going on at the moment, either things that are led by the ICE or things which are involving our collaboration that, in fact, some of you may well want to join in with if, if you haven't already. So to, so to kind of dive in, I guess, um, it strikes me there are three really, really crucial things that we all need to take time to understand and start to share much more loudly across everything we do if we are going to start to turn this talk around the need for, for climate action to address the climate emergency into that real action that actually makes a difference. So first of all, and this may sound really obvious, but first of all, we need to actually stop and understand these hard links between what we all do and the causes of climate change. Because I find it really depressing that none of this is new. While I've, I've only been talking about it sort of in, in the capacity as ICE president for six months, everything I'm talking about in, in terms of evidence, in terms of scientific knowledge, in terms of understanding there's a problem dates back at least 50 years. But somehow these climate issues have taken an enormously long time to get to the top of you know, the, the, the action list in some places around the world. And it's really only this year, perhaps a little bit last year, that we've really started to see it bubble up more frequently onto the list of things to actually do today, um, certainly in our civil engineering space, but also um, around, around wider sectors across the world as well. And that's kind of exciting, we're getting there, but it's also quite depressing in equal measure because it really has taken a very, very long time to get to this point. So those of you who've seen the film will know that um, one of the key points I make in there is that around 70% of the world's carbon dioxide emissions are related to infrastructure. And that's either because of the way we plan and design and build things, so the processes we actually use that create new assets and the energy that's used there, or because of the behaviours that are enabled, that are brought into being because that infrastructure exists. So every single infrastructure asset, whether it's new or old, had a carbon impact when it was built, and most of them continue to have an impact every day as we use all those different systems. So whether we're talking about transport or water or waste or buildings, or it could be anything in the built environment, all of those things had an impact as they were created and continue to have impacts now. And the, the feedback that I've been picking up over the last six months since, since that Shaping Zero film was launched is that for an awful lot of people who've been working in the, in the I guess the broad infrastructure space, but specifically the civil engineering space, for their entire careers, their feedback has been, this is a pretty shocking message because we're a community of people who like to think that we are making the world a better place. A lot of us are motivated by the idea that we, you know, we want to make things better. We want to improve life for people around the world. So actually to, to unpack this and say, well, hang on a minute, there's a problem here. We're actually causing harm has been something that I think for a lot of people has been quite difficult to kind of process and take on board because we just simply haven't, we haven't seen it, we haven't processed it, we certainly haven't been acting on it uh, until now. But because we know that these carbon emissions for which we are essentially responsible in either a direct or an indirect sense for 70% of those emissions around the world, we know that they are the primary cause of climate change around the world. And that is just, frankly, just it, it's not acceptable. We absolutely have to change in terms of what we're going to do. So cutting through all of the noise, all of the, the political, I guess, of goal setting and, and noise making, um, in particular ahead of the COP26 um, summit that's happening in November of this year, what it means in terms of infrastructure, what it means for civil engineering specifically, is that broadly speaking, we have to find ways to cut the carbon emissions that are associated with infrastructure in half, or ideally more, between now and 2030, so that's in this decade, if we're going to have any chance of hitting a net zero position by 2050. And it is absolutely clear that we are not currently moving anywhere near fast enough. And of course, that's not helped by the fact that this is not a linear reduction path, because all around 
the world, as I've already mentioned, different countries are at different stages, different choices are being made around onward development, and they will have a huge bearing on future carbon emissions, because of course, we tend to be involved in designing and building and creating things that actually are out there in the world for decades. So if we design them in a way that first of all has a large carbon impact when they're created, but then continues to have a large carbon emissions impact for every single day, week and year that those different assets are out there and in use, actually we are setting ourselves up for an even tougher path in future. So it really is quite a, a complex problem, shall we say, in terms of where we go. Um, but I think part of the key in terms of how we how we start to address that and coming on to the second key sort of point, I suppose, that I just wanted to, to cover today. Um, really, one of the crucial things to me is that we all need to make sure we're speaking the same language when it comes to carbon, because at the moment we have a lot of people who are using words that they haven't really taken the time to understand. So even, even the phrase net zero carbon, in fact, is something which is being thrown around and it, it quickly becomes obvious that some people have understood what it means and some people haven't taken the time to think about what it really means and what they could do about it. And it is tricky because these carbon emissions, well, carbon dioxide is invisible. It has no respect whatsoever for national borders or, or boundaries. It, it doesn't care. You know, if it is if it is created somewhere and if it's allowed to be released into the atmosphere, it is out there and it is out there along with all the other carbon emissions that have also been generated over that time. And so I think that the fact that we haven't really understood what these core concepts really mean and we haven't really stopped to think about what that knock on effect actually is, is really still holding us back. So there are basically, in my view at least, there are, there are three key concepts we need to understand. And, and those of you who've spent the time um, watching the Shaping Zero film would have come across some of this. So the first one is about what does net zero carbon actually mean? And in a whole planet sense, it's just simply a balanced state where the amount of carbon dioxide emissions that we send up into the atmosphere is matched by the ability of our natural systems and our technologies to take that same amount of carbon dioxide essentially back out of the atmosphere at any given time. So it doesn't mean we can't have any carbon emissions. It means that we have to understand those carbon emissions and we have to make sure that we are finding ways of essentially netting them off, of essentially removing them from the atmosphere at at least the same rate that they're being generated. So it's a point of balance. And it means that if we don't understand the emissions, we have a problem because of course we won't know if we're doing enough. But what we can always do, of course, is we can measure the amount of carbon dioxide up in our atmosphere. So that is kind of the ultimate truth. And that is the, the acid test in terms of whether or not we're actually having any success here, because we can measure that at a global level. What we, don't, what we need to do though, is bring it down to a much more local level to start to understand what we can actually do about it. So if you've seen the film, you'll know that I use the analogy of a bath to talk about um, that, that concept of net zero. So the tap being the carbon emissions we create across the world is water pouring into the bath and, and the plug hole or the drain being the processing power that we have to get the water out of the bath. So the emissions out of the atmosphere and to turn them back into less harmful forms, whether that's on the land or whether it's a part of you know, the ocean cycles, there are all kinds of different solutions we can take there using both natural or technologically led um, solutions. So the, the, the challenge we've got at the moment is that we are miles the wrong side of a net zero balance. Um, in fact, in many cases, we're going the wrong way at the moment. So 75% of the world's energy is still created by fossil fuels and all of that process, all that processing, all of that energy creation is still contributing to the fact that we have a growing amount of greenhouse gases up there in the atmosphere and primarily the carbon dioxide emissions. Um, which, as I say, is so closely linked to the infrastructure world that we that we all know and love, I guess. But the, the, I guess the key point for me is that when it comes to net zero, that there's no shortcut. The, the bath is the bath. The atmosphere is the atmosphere. We cannot escape the effects if the bath overflows, so if the atmosphere becomes essentially um, unable to cope with the level of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that are up there. So we have to find ways to bring down the water level in the bath or to bring down the level of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, it isn't an optional activity, it's an absolutely essential one. And so that, that then, I guess, brings me on to another couple of concepts, which I'll just touch on very briefly. One of them is around climate mitigation and the fact that that is not the same as, as climate adaptation. And those are two terms that are really, really crucial here. So the piece around mitigation is all essentially to do with the carbon reduction piece, how to get that carbon out of the atmosphere, how to find ways to cut the carbon dioxide emissions associated with everything you do. So if we are going to mitigate, i.e. reduce 
the amount of carbon dioxide emissions that are out there, we have to do things differently. So there are literally thousands of things we can do here as practicing engineers. So we can, first of all, think about the tap on that bar, the, the emissions generation side of things. We can simply find ways to turn down the tap. So we can plan better, we can design better, we can build better, we can maintain better, we can operate better. And when I say better across all those things, what that means is that we need to be going about our daily work, not just in line with cost and program and quality and safety requirements, but also with a much more conscious eye on the carbon impacts of what we do. Because we have choices, that's the whole point of being an engineer. We, you know, we, we try to find the best options in terms of what we want to do. We can do all of that better and with carbon in mind. And of course, the other thing we can do is we can help in terms of improving the way that the bath drains. So essentially increasing the size of the plug hole, if you like. And that's the pieces around carbon capture and boosting our natural systems and so on. And where, where I think that gets really interesting is it doesn't have to cost more. Sometimes these changes can actually cut costs over the whole life of an infrastructure asset. And the sooner we think about all these sorts of changes in the context of a particular project, a particular investment, a particular program, a particular place, the, first of all, the sooner we'll see the benefits in terms of that climate action, but the cheaper the whole set of actions will get and, and the level of risk also tends to come down as well. So essentially there's nothing that we couldn't start thinking about now in terms of that mitigation piece. It's simply for us to start to do it. Um, but all of that, of course, is around kind of the attack strategy, if you like, for carbon. The, 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 the climate mitigation piece is really the way that we're going to attack those levels of carbon. But of course, we also need a defence strategy as well, which is where the adaptation, the climate adaptation and resilience pieces fit in. Because no matter what we do, we have 30 years of a worsening climate ahead of us. So at least until 2050, even if we get everything right pretty much from tomorrow, which of course we can't, even if we start to get things right and go as fast as we can, we will still have probably 30 years of a worsening climate ahead of us because a lot of our past actions are essentially already in that enormous global system, which simply just takes time to change. So I suppose that, that sort of brings me around to the thinking that we, we can't build our way out. It's not possible to simply sort of build higher defensive walls, for example, or, or, or to find solutions to all the, all the uh, climate-led issues that we're going to see across the world in terms of the, the increasing frequency of natural disasters and, and their increasing intensity as well. So we need to do the, both the mitigation piece and the adaptation piece if we're going to work our way towards a properly sustainable future. Now, hopefully in everything I've just said there, it, it's blindingly obvious that speed really does matter here. This is, this is genuinely urgent. It is not an optional set of activities. This is genuinely something that will be life-threatening across the planet in many, many different ways over the years to come if we, don't, if we don't get to grips with it. But where that turns, I think, for all of us into a fabulous opportunity is that, of course, with that sort of existential threat comes the potential for all of us as infrastructure experts, civil engineers, the people who understand infrastructure and its potential to change, I genuinely do think that we can go forward from now with a new purpose, essentially, in terms of writing ourselves into the history books of the future for all the right reasons. So, so to deliver all the benefits of the infrastructure that we want, all the functions that we want. So we want to be connected. We want to have clean water. We want to, you know, we want to have communities that are, that are safe and all the rest of it for people to live in. But we also need to do all of that without causing harm in a climate sense, as, as I've been talking about. So it really is urgent that we get on and act. There are thousands of different ways that we can do it. The, the challenge is that it's an incredibly complex problem and not something that's that easy to kind of get your arms around, but it is something where we can all help. So in terms of how we get on with that as quickly as possible and how we all work together all over the world to make a really serious difference in terms of cutting carbon, in terms of getting to grips with this issue of, of climate change, I think that there's a series of thoughts here in terms of what we might do. First of all, everything I've just been talking about there, learn about, apply the language of climate action through everything we do. There, there is no reason why we couldn't all be introducing the topic into all sorts of different conversations. And I get it that sometimes on some projects and with some clients and in some contexts, it might be difficult to introduce some of these things into what we're talking about. It might not seem that it's the, the most important issue of the day, but that doesn't mean that you can't produce it. It doesn't mean you can't start to build some of the thinking into the design work or into the construction work anyway, especially if it doesn't increase um, cost, it has no other wider impacts, except for the fact that actually you are benefiting the carbon 
outcomes that you get to. But I think the second thought there is that small rapid actions really will add up. It's a funny one, climate change, because perhaps the reason it's taken us so long to notice that there really is an urgent problem to tackle is because actually it's been a creeping problem. It's not like COVID where suddenly we say, right, we have to change the way we are living for the, you know, the, the immediate period of time because this is, this is not you know, safe in terms of a, a public health point of view. Climate change is very different. It, it's crept up on us. It's been caused by lots and lots of single decisions, small actions all over the world over, over many, many decades. And so I suspect we can probably only solve it with the same kind of approach. So, so small, rapid actions everywhere we possibly can rather than looking and waiting for somebody to sort of magic an answer out of thin air or come up with a, a silver bullet that will, that will solve the problem. So we're gonna need change at all levels, all the way through from government policy change, new green funding streams, right the way down through to very, very small scale changes, as I was just describing at the level of the smallest project, the smallest investment. But I think we have to be confident that all those small actions really will actually add up. So I think one of the things that all of us can hopefully do is to really stop and think about the outcomes that each of our different projects, each of our different engagements, each of our different conversations can have in terms of the carbon impact. Can you find the carbon impact within the bits that you can directly influence? Can you get at them? Can you eliminate them? Can you reduce them? Can you mitigate them as best you can? Because if all of us start to do that, it really will actually make a difference. And of course, Yes, we can all have a direct influence, as I've been describing there, but also we are all people in a much bigger system of communities. We can all seek to bring about change. We've all got wider influence. We've got the ability to inspire other people to do things differently, to ask the right questions, to be provocative, actually overall, just to be great engineers. And it really doesn't matter what role you play in a professional sense, actually, if you are somebody who's able to sort of tell a new story in terms of climate action and what's driving you to, to follow this route through your career and inspire others to do the same, all of those things, again, really will add up. And I, I guess it's a bit of a challenge because we don't have all the answers. There is no one perfect answer. And as engineers, we like to have answers, don't we? We like to have methods. We like to have neat, tidy solutions and so on. But actually, in this case, we are going to have to accept that we know what we know what pretty good looks like. We probably have 80% of what we need. We need to get on and we need to accept that we will be able to flex that plan as we go forward and we'll be able to build in better solutions as, as we go forward. And, and I think it gets quite exciting because we've never explored project thinking or investment thinking or infrastructure thinking from this point of view before. So I think there'll be an awful lot of things we could gain quite quickly if we all start to think along these lines fairly quickly. So coming on um, finally to, to the pieces around what's actually already happening, what, what's been going on. Um, I've given you quite a lot more there than, than, than was in the, the, the film that was launched back in November anyway. But in terms of kind of bringing it right up to date, I mean, I guess the first thing I would sort of observe in terms of what's been going on in the last six months is that, first of all, in terms of timing, I've partly been lucky, if, if I'm perfectly honest. I, I obviously knew I was going to concentrate on on shaping zero, on the need for climate action as my ICE theme you know, sometime before, before last November. But of course, what's happened in the meantime is that, for example, we've had a US election. We now have an extremely different global political context, in part because of that, but also because of other things that are going on as well. But it does feel that, that climate action is now coming up firmly through on that global agenda in a much more solid and, and hopefully permanent way in terms of what we need to do. But in the meantime, in terms of other things that have been going on, I mean, I guess my job for the year is, is just to continue to put points like this across to as many people as will listen as loudly and clearly as I possibly can and try to make these connections between climate change and our ability as engineers to be relevant and visible, to be, to be valuable in this space. And it, it does feel that it is cutting through. Um, and as I say, partly perhaps because it's good timing in a, in a political sense internationally, but also I think because the urgency is now feeling real and perhaps COVID has also helped us to realise that there really is a need to actually get on top of some of these, um, these major global issues in a way that we perhaps didn't think we could before. But beyond that, um, from an ICE point of view, um, just last month, we ratified an agreement to put climate action at the very top of the ICE's action list, not just for this year, which is obviously what I'd kind of hoped for, but for actually the next five years. So to really get to grips with supporting 
the international community of civil engineers that that touch ICE, whether they're ICE members or whether it's people who, who come across the, the work that the ICE does. So to really support that international community in creating real change specifically around carbon. Um, some of you if, you, if you've seen the Shaping Zero film will already know pieces around the carbon project, which is something which we launched um, almost a year ago, actually, it was last July, which is now, it's now taking on new shape in terms of having a, a larger advisory body. It's got a better scope now in terms of what we really need to do. But the purpose of that from an ICE point of view is to, is to fill some really big and important technical gaps in our knowledge right now so that everybody has a consistent start point in terms of where we need to go. So there are pieces around measurement that are coming through because one of the initial problems you run into when you start thinking about carbon dioxide emissions is you suddenly realize, well, hang on a minute, how, how, do, I, how do I know? <laughs> how, how do I know what my impact is, whether I'm designing something or building something or whether I'm trying to understand the operation of, it could be anything, this, this railway, this waterworks, whatever it might be. And of course, it's really crucial that we can compare like with like, that we can compare different options, that we can look at different solutions and also, that we know how we're getting on in terms of our carbon impact. As I said, we can measure the amount of carbon dioxide up there in the atmosphere, but how are we going to know if we're making progress fast enough? How are we going to know if we, as civil engineers, are doing enough because we, we can't cheat? Um, so there's a lot of work going on in that, in that measurement space. There's lots of um, effort going on to start to standardize things, to start to draw together different methods and to really start to, to I guess, put out as much best practice as possible in this space. The second strand is around, around capabilities. So there's been a lot of work done already in terms of um, learning modules and content to do with carbon literacy. So some of those key terms I was talking about. Um, the, one of the top priorities actually going forward, and as I say, within now a five year context, but one of the first things we're really going to get to is making sure that in terms of ICE members, that there are new modules available that are properly accredited and so on to make sure that people really start to understand the key terms around carbon and climate. And there are also some really significant changes coming to things like university uh, curriculum um, teaching in terms of what gets covered, because it's fair to say that in most civil engineering courses, certainly in the UK, but I'm interested to know if it's the same in, in South Africa and elsewhere, um, there is almost no mention of some of these issues at all right now, despite the fact that there are such strong links between climate and infrastructure, as I've been talking about. Um, so there's lots to come on that, um, probably kicking off in September with the new academic year, um, certainly in the UK, but also obviously those will, those will hopefully be shared across the world as appropriate as well. We're also, um, ICE is going to be the, the lead author for an update to a document called PAS 2080, which is, um, PAS stands for Publicly Available Specification for those in, in the, the sort of the standards and regulatory type world. Um, but essentially, it's a, it's a step down from an ISO, so an international standard. Um, but there's going to be an update to the, the document that already exists on carbon management, and ICE will be lead author for that, sponsored by the, the British Standards Institute. But that hopefully will become an international document in probably about a year's time. So that will pull together the latest thinking in terms of best practice around that capability piece for, for carbon management and making sure that, that that is available for everybody to, to access and to think about and to share across different contexts. Um, coming on to, I guess, just a couple of other pieces uh, that some of you may have noticed, there's, there's a piece that's been launched to do with um, trying to find carbon champions um, across the ICE community and in fact going forward even more widely because we're going to try and open it up to other, um, other engineering institutions as well. Um, so if actually any of you listening have got fantastic case studies to do with carbon reduction, if you've got a story to share, it could be something that's planned, it can be something that's already built, it could be something that you're changing, um, you can share the details of that and you can join this community of carbon champions that's just starting to be built now. So we've just had the first and I think second round of applications coming in. Um, and the idea is that then we can start to showcase great practice internationally and, and start to hopefully give people ideas and inspiration in terms of what they could do differently because very often it's, it's quite difficult to, to start to figure out, well, you know, what, what do I do for the best? What could I do fairly easily? What could I do tomorrow? And hopefully we'll start to be able to, to share some of those stories. Um, and, the, and the last thing in an international sense that, that we've been doing, um, and I mentioned this in, my, in the speech I gave um, on, at my inauguration back in November, is that the ICE has joined something called ICSI, which is the International Coalition for Sustainable Infrastructure. Um, and we are now playing an increasingly key role actually in shaping shaping the plans for this international 
grouping. It's got tentacles into 136 countries all over the world. And the idea is that it's very much about learning and collaborating and signposting really the very best all over the world um, to do with both the climate resilience and also the carbon reduction or the, the climate mitigation spaces. So I guess that's a very, very brief picture in terms of lots of the things that are, that are in progress and happening now and where, where you could keep an eye out for, for things starting to, to emerge and bubble over the rest of my year and indeed into the following years, because as I've just said, we're going to have a five year focus on, on carbon now. Um, but my overall goal, I suppose, for, for this year, just to close is, is and I hope I've done it in what I've just talked about there, is, is just to convey not only the, the scale of this challenge in terms of climate action, but also the hugely exciting, properly exciting potential for really valuable change that lies ahead for all of us if we can just make that move from starting to understand it and turning it into real action. And I, I actually feel really quite jealous of, of some of you listening today because actually I think you have got the enviable, enviable position as people who are relatively new in some cases to the industry as a whole, you get to step out into your careers and in infrastructure and, and work for all these years ahead. You will be the generation who can really help to make this change real because this is not gonna be something that's finished in the near term future at all. It's gonna be year after year after year of really hard work and effort to make sure that we've got things quickly on the right track and then we keep it there. So I'm going to close with the same big question that you'll have seen in my film that I've been asking uh, all year, essentially. Um, and, and I guess it's going to be the next six months as well as the past six as well. Um, but when it comes to, to climate and carbon and everything I've talked about there, what are you going to do? Thank you. Rachel, that was fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Um, I know that uh, a lot of the concepts were, were discussed in your video um, in conjunction with the very eminent people that you interviewed and you brought in there. Um, the views of these influential people and yourself as well as Ice President um, really brings that message across. Um, we don't need a young lady uh, floating across the ocean to explain what climate change is. We can see it every day. We look out the window and we see what is happening around us. Um, something that you, you mentioned uh, right at the beginning is that we are now suffering the effects of 50 years of action that has caused the climate change. Those 50 years come on top of a previous 50 years or another 50 where the industrial re revolution came about. We started industrializing things and uh, we certainly got a very big uh, head start on those type of um, energy sources that were readily available, which were fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, we need to look at various different ways in which we can uh, innovate how we generate energy and what energy we can use and harness to for our needs. Um, what I'm, I'm going to, I've got a couple of questions which I'm going to ask uh, both you and uh, Friedrich, um, but I'm going to ask uh, any of the attendees, if they'd like to ask any questions of the panelists, please put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, as they come through, we will then ask those and we will pose them to the panelists on your behalf. Um, so my first question uh, kind of uh, is a little bit of a tricky one. Um, COVID-19 is ever present around uh, the world today. Uh, when it first arose, everybody went into lockdown and there was no transport. We all spent at least five weeks sitting indoors, not going outside and not moving about. And a lot of our infrastructure and everything came to a grinding halt. I saw some very interesting programs around the impact that that had on our global climate. The ice caps grew, they, the hole in the ozone layer closed up. There were a whole lot of things that happened. Can you maybe just give a bit of insight into how you think that, uh, right, that is not a sustainable way of doing things, but can you give some idea on how you think some of those things might impact uh, our way of doing things into the future? Do you want to go first? I feel I've talked a lot already. <laughs> let, me, let me start there. Thank you, Elaine. 
Uh, we've had three, four webinars already on this topic in terms of the impact of COVID on transport and the behavioral change that we experience in South Africa. Luckily, we've had uh, three uh, main government authorities, Cape Town Metro and Ithaquini, and uh, the National Road Agency, who has exceptionally good transport data, and they illustrate the change in behavior, uh, or at least in the, the volumes. Not that that behavior is uh, voluntary, that behavior is forced upon us uh, through COVID, mm -hmm. but the drop in movement of people in the peak period was as high as, as 80%. Uh, and the, the figures illustrated that. And we debated as a division, why do we not claim in this interim the not so valuable asset of the road infrastructure, especially in the urban environment, claim that for non-motorized transport or for other means, uh, we need to take away parking in, in cities, in metros, and we ask, why can't we do that? The, the situation in, in government environment is not that you make a decision and tomorrow you, you have that deployed. I, I see Rachel laughs about it, but this is the reality. Uh, it all needs to go to a very stringent regulatory environment and the Minister of Transport or the Minister, if it's in a local government environment of local government and traditional affairs need to make an announcement and the new regulations need to be promulg promulgated. However, from, from our side in the, in the transport arena, we are really thinking, how do we advocate that we can do better with the infrastructure, number one. And how can we do better now that people can see that not all people have to work in offices? We do understand that industries, people need to be behind a machine. You need to go down the earth in a mining environment. You need to be present at a, at a power station. Those, those matters you, you will never be able to change. We need to start thinking differently about urban development. Look, we have a major backlog of what happened prior to 1994, where people, the labor force lives, lived and still living extremely far away from, from the place of work. And that generates a lot of transport movement. And if we can say that while well, there is a fantastic rail system in South Africa, then let us use the rail system. However, you all know what has happened in the, it's all over the news, what happened to the Praza environment. Trains in Cape Town aren't running anymore. Uh, trains, uh, the, the Public Rail Association, trains in, in Gauteng aren't, aren't serving the labor people in the way it should serve. So what is the solution? If you have, and, and this brings me to another aspect of the social inclusion of all people in this environment. We cannot just as academics or as engineers only consider what we can do. We have to put our hat on and put ourselves in those people's position and say, how do I serve with my knowledge those people in less privileged positions. It's not that it's not that simple. Rachel asked, what can we do? So let me simply say we need to influence government and clients and call in the academics to think in a new way in terms of infrastructure development. I have not in the last few years seen a specific chapter in a terms of reference where a client specifies, illustrate in your project proposal how you are going to consider the environment. I know of architects in their green building uh, 
processes that they get accolades for adopting a green approach. But I'm not seeing any accolades being issued to a green civil engineer project. We, we give project accolades to the most grand and the most impressive structure. Uh, it's just the nature of, of, of civil engineering. And that is what we really need to, need to change. And we as, as volunteers need to really start focusing where we can influence. Uh, so that's in brief, you've asked. Uh, I, I could just give you one last statistics. Transport in South Africa contributes 14% of the, of the carbon footprint of which road transport of that 14% accounts to 90 or 94 percent depending on how you measure that but then what is the causing the main footprint our energy supply in south africa we have coal for for basically free compared to other countries and we keep on developing new coal fired power stations however the paris agreement says by 2050 there will be no pa coal fired power stations now, if that is the case, a power station is not built in five months, not in five years. And if we want to, and I've seen in some documentation shared by yourself, and I'm involved in some of that processes, that the IRP 2019 of the Department of Mineral and uh, Mining uh, Resources states that about 25% of the coal-fired power stations will be closed in 2030 and a further number in 2040. However, there aren't any new plans for the same energy provision. Wind and solar has a role to play, but there's some other supplementary resources uh, that need to be deployed that are not environmental negative. And that is nuclear as an example. That's another debate. Absolutely. A totally different debate. One which we had a couple of weeks ago with uh, Dr. Rob Adam, uh, head of the Square Kilometer Array. Um, Rachel, um, your, your ideas on how the COVID shutdown taught us a lesson? Yeah, it's so many parallels, actually. It's really interesting to hear what, what Friedrich just said, because almost everything you talked about was a very, very similar experience around here in the, in the UK as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess in sort of headline terms, I think COVID has given us, in a strange way, a, a really interesting opportunity for change. Because exactly as, as you said, Alan, it's um, the, the impact, our impact on the world around us suddenly became rather obvious in, in various different ways because we suddenly changed the way we did things because of things like, you know, having to stay at home and, and all that kind of thing and, and just changing the way that, you know, our everyday lives went, went, you know, went together, I suppose. So for me, the trick is to catch some of those good changes and not slip back <laughs> to what actually were the most ridiculous bad habits of the past in some cases. I mean, you know, right. just to take transport again as an example, I mean, you know, the, the inefficiencies certainly around here in terms of the way that we use, for example, the rail networks where you've got just a few hours a day where it's utterly crammed full and then the rest of the day is <laughs> practically empty. You think, what? doing and, and then it turns out of course that 90 percent of those people didn't need to be on the train in the first place as we've all now discovered and you just think well you know that there's got to be some really big opportunities out of that in terms of how we rethink those systems and i think that piece around um uh the the, the social impact and trying to end up with something that is a more fair set of solutions is also going to be a really important piece of, of what we do because it, it strikes me quite often that when it comes to infrastructure generally it doesn't matter which sector we're looking at so we could be looking at transport but we could also be looking at the at water or buildings or energy or anything else um, it's not that it's not the function of the infrastructure that's the issue we, we want we need the connectivity whether it's digital whether it's physical we, we need we want the energy to do the various things that you know to, to give us you know, power in our homes and workplaces wherever it might be and you know we, we want all these things we want obviously clean water we want etc 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 it's not the function that's the problem, it's the form it's taken 
over the last 200 years and, and exactly as we just said that the, the, the sort of the path we've put ourselves on and rattled along without a care in the world for so long which is which is now causing us you know th this particular um issue around the the climate effects of what we've been doing so uh, it just feels that that we're not going to get a better opportunity to put it all back together again uh, you know the, than the one we have right now because First of all, it's urgent already. But secondly, you know, we, what do we want? Another world crisis? I mean, come on. Let's just, why don't we take the one we've already got in terms of COVID and use that as a, as a springboard to change? Um, yeah. what, one interesting, just brief thought, actually, in terms of the energy impacts. I, I was interested, Friedrich, in what you said around how at the moment in South Africa, the, the energy sector has a far greater carbon impact than the transport sector. If you go back not very many years in the UK, we had the same pattern. But over the last 10 or so years, we've had a big shift to renewables generation in the UK, particularly uh, wind and solar and a bit of um, increasingly tidal as well. And all of a sudden, in the last, I think, couple of years, the transport sector is now the biggest culprit. And it's really interesting. It's it, not so much that, that you know, it's not, it's not always about the absolute levels. It's the relative impact of the different sectors. I can already see here the difference that is making in terms of making a lot of people around the transport side of life sit up and start to pay attention and say, oh, that's a bit embarrassing, isn't it? You know, <laughs> how is it we've got ourselves into this position? I, and I, I'm not suggesting for a minute that, that from a UK point of view, we've got it exactly right. We are, we are a country where our consumption um, far outweighs our production in terms of carbon. So we rely on, on energy that is generated elsewhere, on products that are generated elsewhere. So we conveniently disregard that in terms of what we do around here. So there's a long way to go for everybody, but it's, it's, it's a really interesting, tangled, complicated picture. But of course, we've all got to get ourselves going in the right direction. Otherwise, we, we won't hit that 2050 crucial moment, at which point the impacts of this whole problem become far, far more significant. I think uh, you just hit it on the head. Nothing is going to change if we don't change. Yeah. I think human beings as social creatures need to have that connection, need to have that interaction with each other. And that's something that we've learned through COVID mm. and the lockdowns. Um, I think more than anything else, um, there's also quite a, quite a difference between the developed world and the developing world. Um, if you look at Africa, a large part of Africa is still undeveloped. If you take Africa as a, a continent, I think there's I think there's less than two percent of it properly urbanized. If you look at Europe and the UK or the USA, there are pockets which are majorly, hugely developed. Mm. All the infrastructure for urbanization and living has already been built. So the carbon that has been used to generate that infrastructure has already been spent. To get to that level of um, infrastructure in Africa, for example, or other third world countries or developing countries, we need to expend probably more carbon or more effort to get that infrastructure in place because it doesn't exist yet. I think the challenge is going to be, and that is really the challenge for the current engineers and our future engineers on how to develop that infrastructure in a carbon neutral manner so that we do not impact the world the way uh, Europe and the developed world has already. Um, it's something that has been spent, we, we can't bring it back. But we can make sure that we change the way we develop our future infrastructure as we go forward. Um, I've got a couple of questions which have been raised. Um, from from the, the participants, so that's awesome. Uh, Carabo has raised a question. Uh, this is quite an interesting one. I'd like to see what both Friedrich and Rachel have to say on this. Uh, is it ethical to capitalize on environmental solutions we come up with? Does it somehow lead to a lack of momentum in the project? Do we want to capitalize on new innovation to save on carbon emissions? For me, I think it's, it's a very the, easy answer. It's a dilemma there, isn't it? <laughs> it, it, it? It's an interesting question, but I think actually the answer um, is, in, is in this changing context that I've spoken about so much, I mean, very, very briefly, and I don't know whether Friedrich would agree with me or not, but I, I think this just has to become a part 
of what we do when we when we think about whether it's new infrastructure or whether it's improving the existing systems and how it works we have simply got to be helpful in terms of finding ways to exactly as you just said essentially neutralize <laughs> net off call it what you will the the carbon emissions impact of, of the existing and any new systems we come up with so I, I guess I wouldn't put it in terms of capitalizing on it, but I think it's absolutely something that has to be within the, the boundary of what we think about and how we get to those solutions and what those solutions are and so on it, it, in itself is, isn't really necessarily at the heart of this. It's just a fact that we do. And I think there will be plenty of investment needed. I'm, I'm not sure it'll be capitalizing on it. I think there's going to be a lot of thinking and a lot of innovation needed and so on before we get to that point. But yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Friedrich? I just respond on this uh, in terms of capitalization. It's uh, I think it's perhaps not the appropriate term, but we have to in every project consider all elements that influence our society, our mobility. If I now put my my transport hat up, uh, economy, sustainability, all of those words that we use so easily in a report but when we get to talking to people and doing Rachel referred to we should stop being in a talking environment and go into the do environment and I'm saying that about every second meeting I'm in in the last 10 months really asking and pleading with people let us do, start doing and when you have this project in front of you. Put your environmental hat on for that very short period and ask, how does this influence my environment? And the environment, and Rachel referred to small building blocks. If we get people closer to their place of work, forget about the the mode of transport that we're going to use. If our urban development is done in a holistic way and not in a fragmented way, if we don't work in silos, if we as civil engineers are in line with the politician, in line with the university new research, we are the practical hands on the, on, in the field. The researchers are there, but we need to take hands. It's not anything about us against them in any or us against government. We are all breathing the same air. We drink from the same water source. We get in the same train. We use the same road. We use the same energy. And from that perspective, we've in our division, said that we need to get back to, as an example, really only as an example, to get back to the fundamentals of transport, where we consider it is not only infrastructure that plays a role. It is the land use and social inclusion, to use one other example. It is also the services that we provide, the train, the minibus taxi, the freight transport. Consider South Africa. We have the economic hub in Gauteng and with lots of neighboring mining activities in the Northwest and in Mpumalanga and in Limpopo. All of that energy that we create need to go somewhere. So we export. Where do we export? To the main harbors that are 500 or 1600 Ks away. But we don't even export a product, we export the raw material, which is even a bigger sin. So can you see, then we go and we export it to China, as an example, they manufacture our solar panels. I'm using now, again, just an example. We import it and look how good we are. Do, do you hear me? I'm, uh, I'm you, you, you can hear, I'm now getting quite passionate. Look uh -huh. how good we are. We, we don't generate anything. The, the carbon footprint is created elsewhere. It's not created in my country. Now, how do we live with that type of conscience? So 
from our division then we said, but let us in this item of back to the fundamentals, let us also include a learning unit or course material that deals with energy and the environment. Now, if we use that module and apply it to buildings, architecture, urban environment, it, it goes much, much wider than just the transport sector. We can use the same DNA elements to really have an integrated development. So uh, can we capitalize? Well, we actually have to every little thing that we do, do it in an integrated way, stop living in, in silos and say, I am such a good structural engineer, I will build them the most fancy bridge or building, but how we get to that point, I'm actually not interested. It's an ethical responsibility of each engineer. And therefore, we reach out to universities to see how do we assist with uh, research topics so that that seed can be, be planted at a very early stage and we can build from that. I'm not sure I've answered, but I've, I've given some thought, I think. Rachel? I think that, yeah. I think that's very, very interesting because we're getting very similar thought patterns, but in different contexts from the UK and the developed world. And we're looking at areas where there is less development and so on. Um, one of the issues that I think we also need to try and explore is the, the impact of poverty and the cost of this. Uh, it is a very, very expensive thing to change your systems that you've optimized to work efficiently and cost effectively. When you now have innovation, it's going to cost a lot more to do the innovation and then optimize those uh, parameters that we have going forward. So we might have a more costly process coming forward uh, than we currently have at the moment. But if we don't do that, the cost is going to be on the environment rather than our economy and our pockets. So I think uh, we've got a little bit of that to, to think about as well. Um, I, I see that we, sorry, I just see that we, I see we have uh, just kind of overrun our uh, slot by about five minutes. Um, I do want to thank everybody who has joined uh, today. Um, it's been a very interesting discussion and an excellent debate. And I think, Rachel, your, your question that you've posed everybody, what are you going to do to change? I think that is the most important aspect that we need to put out there. And just uh, a very interesting question. The last one that I'll bring up is how can I join this movement as a first year student? So my first response is join the ICE. That's the very first start because through that channel, you'll be able to be exposed to all of the concepts that are happening at the moment. The thought leadership, the new impacts that are happening, the new techniques that are happening, and you're gonna have exposure right around the globe to the best practices that are happening. Set out in the, uh, what is it, the PAS 2018? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, that's the first way of starting. And then obviously also there's your carbon champions that uh, you were talking about, Rachel. So I think we need to have a look at how we can integrate that and bring it into a, a more global perspective of what we can do to help the globe rather than just what will happen in our own little environments. Uh, because as you said, we all breathe the same air. Kokomelo, uh, um, um, you've been very quiet and uh, I see you've had some connectivity issues. Uh, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, yes, I've been having issues on my side, but uh, it's all sorted now. I think I only have a comment and I'll be back in mind uh, what Rachel said about um, small rapid action being the way to um, mitigate the effect that's already been caused. Um, because as um, the Shaping Film, uh, Shaping Zero Film says, um, about 30 years of global um, warming has already been built into the system. So 
this is going to be like um, a very how can I how can I put this uh, to join this with what the first years has asked. Uh, it really is on our hands, and especially in developing countries where we haven't had as much of an impact on everything like that. We do have sort of a clean slate to even champion the way forward for other developed countries. So that's really my only comment. And I'd like to thank Rachel and Friedrich for um, uh, placing the students with all this information. It really is thought provoking, and it's nice to see that students are engaging with it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thanks. Friedrich, any last thoughts? Elaine, thanks very much, Justin. How can we join the movement? And I'm not going to take any uh, members away from you, uh, <laughs> especially with uh, some of the students. We allow dual membership and we, and we really support uh, sharing knowledge. So if people want to join ICE, uh, we can support that process. However, uh, we have the student chapter of WITS uh, present and we offer a free uh, membership while they are students and then we recover that in the years to come and through that membership they get access to all the documentation and privileges that that we offer and 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 we have to do that uh, we, we can't just wait until somebody's a professional and then start giving them any attention we have to start with our young people our at university if I look at my children, they didn't become nice children just when they turned 21. I must say they turned very clever, very quickly after about 24, 25, because there is a period that they always say, dad, you don't know a thing, but then they, they learn very quickly, but that, that's a joke. Uh, but really we, we have to reach out um, and thank you for allowing us to be be part of this session. Um, I have shared with Elaine that we really need to reach out to each other. Uh, earlier, briefly to Rochelle, uh, Rachel, and uh, just to say um, we need to uh, share information and share uh, academic material. Uh, we, we, it's no use that we reinvent the wheel. Uh, we need to apply it in our individual uh, environments. Yes, that is true, but that's what our, us as engineers can do. Thank you very much for the participation. Right. Thank you very much, Friedrich. Um, your last words, Rachel? Yeah, very, very briefly. Um, I, I think I'd just follow on really from what, um, from what Friedrich just said there. I think for me, what makes this topic so interesting and what gives it such potential is that it is affecting everybody everywhere right now in different ways, but it, it's genuinely a, an everyone everywhere problem. And that is really unusual. I think there's only one other problem like this, I guess, that I can think of in, in recent times. And of course that's COVID, which is also affecting everyone everywhere. So we've kind of got both these things at once. And, and coming back to something I mentioned earlier, I just think, you know, we are not going to get a better opportunity than now to start to do things differently. So th that, that comment just now in terms of the, the uh, you know, the, the student membership and how important it is to, to engage all the rest of it, I, I, I couldn't agree more. You know, you all have many of these answers. Don't, don't think there's loads of experts out here who have all the answers. This is something that we're all thinking about live <laughs> right now. So, so you can all join in now and, and it doesn't matter, you know, what role you hold and, you know, who you, who you work for and all the rest of it. If you have ideas, now is the time. Absolutely. I 100% agree with you. Uh, Rachel, thank you very much for making the time to join us today. Um, I do want to just take the theme a little bit further. Um, the ICE is hosting the Brunel International Lecture Series around the world. Uh, it is a, a very interesting and topical lecture. It is uh, the, uh, the American version the American flavor, <laughs> the America's flavor is being held on the 19th uh, of May. Um, please go to the ICE website for that. And we're also going to be circulating the details of the Africa leg, uh, which is specifically aimed at the context within Africa. Um, Seth Schultz is uh, presenting this on the 8th of June in, uh, for the African leg. 
and uh, we'll be communicating to all our members and anyone else who's interested uh, about that particular topic. Uh, the topic of the Brunel International Lecture is 21st Century Leadership is Partnership. And he's emphasizing on the collaboration of engineers to try and get to the solution of our problems like climate change and other very, very important elements. So please make sure that you, you sign up for that. Uh, it has been very, very interesting to have that, um, have the presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have a recording of the event today. Uh, it will be put on the ISSA website and uh, the CPD points for that will be allocated uh, after you've answered a couple of questions on the, the video today. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, Rachel, and I wish you well for the rest of your presidential year and the next four years thereafter, driving and pushing the, the uh, carbon project. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Friedrich, for your time and your very good insights in South Africa. Tokomelo, thank you for making arrangements and circulating to all the, uh, the participants so far, and I'm sure we're going to have many more of these going forward. We're getting ahead of the technology. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Keep well Thank and keep... Thank you very much, Elaine, Rachel, Tokomo, everyone. Tom. Thank you very much. Great.